Welcome to all of our viewers today. This is our first of the new series of the Vasculitis Foundation's 2020 educational webinars. There'll be many more new webinars coming out throughout the year. And today we're tackling a pretty important topic, kidneys and vasculitis, and that's because it affects so many in the vasculitis community. The Vasculitis Foundation actually already has two really great video lectures on its website about kidney involvement. Today's webinar will feature uh, an abbreviated version of that by Dr. Elizabeth Brandt. And I highly recommend visiting the Vasculitis Foundation website to watch her full lecture of the video. This webinar, though, is designed more to address the questions that patients have about kidney issues. So let's start by letting me introduce myself. Uh, I am Kathy Olewski, and I'm going to be the webinar host for the 2020 Educational Webinar Series. And my involvement with the webinars and the Vasculitis Foundation will actually bring a patient perspective to our series. I am a patient with Anca vasculitis. I was diagnosed with Anca in 2008. I had gone to 13 specialists before some lab work indicated that I was in kidney failure. My nephrologist ordered an ANCA test because he had just been to a lecture by Dr. Ronald Falk about vasculitis. And then the next step was a kidney biopsy, and that confirmed my diagnosis. And my ne nephrologist then put me in touch with Dr. Falk since I was local to his practice at University of North Carolina. And under his treatment, I went from maybe 30% kidney function to uh, an acceptable level, which I think is about 60%. And that was restored through a variety of plasmapheresis, steroids, drugs, including cytoxin, imuran, and rituximab. I'm hoping these things sound familiar to many of the patients that are listening, because when I talk to others, with ANCA vasculitis or something similar. They've been through the same stages. So I went through treatment and um, for about six years, and I've been in remission for about five years. I'm technically in remission off treatment. And a little bit about myself personally, uh, you can see from the uh, screenshot that's up there on the webinar right now that I'm a martial artist, maybe you can see that. I'm an eighth degree black belt in karate and I have a few karate schools. Uh, I have a family business of martial arts schools. I write a monthly column for an industry magazine and I'm a speaker at conventions on the topics of teaching martial arts, women's empowerment, how to run a small business, things like that. I've been lucky enough to travel as far as Australia and New Zealand as a speaker, even after having been through my treatments. And uh, I'm very active and enjoying my life in remission at this time. So I'd really like now to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Brandt. She is uh, an assistant professor of medicine at Geisel School of Medicine Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Dr. Brandt earned her medical degree at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and she completed her residency in internal medicine at Tulane University Hospital and Clinic in New Orleans, and was our first Vasculitis Foundation Fellow. Uh, Dr. Brandt also completed a nephrology fellowship at the University of North Carolina Medical Center in Chapel Hill, and her specialty is in nephrology. And I just want to say I'm so happy to speak with you again today, Dr. Brandt, and, and uh, I know you from your time at the uh, University of North Carolina, so it's exciting to have you on the webinar today. Oh, thanks, Kathy. It's so nice to hear from you, too. Now I'd like to introduce Sandy Nye. And I think I'm just going to ask Sandy to share a little bit about herself so the viewers can get to know her. Can you do that for us, Sandy? Sure. Hi, I'm Sandy Nye. I was originally diagnosed with undifferentiated connective tissue disorder. So for five years, I took methotrexate and prednisone as needed. After five years of this treatment, my lab showed that my kidneys were failing. A kidney biopsy was done, and I was diagnosed with microscopic polyangiitis. At that time, we started cyclophosphamide and high-dose prednisone. Later, we switched to rituximab and prednisone. And for the past five and a half years, I've continued to take rituximab and daily prednisone. We've attempted to lengthen the time between rituximab infusions, and we've attempted to taper my prednisone below 5 milligrams 
Unfortunately, both have been unsuccessful. So fortunately, though, during the past year, I've stayed in stage 3A of kidney disease, for which I'm very, very, very pleased, and I hope I stay there or even go higher. I'll continue with my rituximab and prednisone as needed until maybe one day I'll be as lucky as Kathy and be able to say I'm in remission and drug-free. I'm pleased to be here today to help with this kidney webinar. Well, that's great, Sandy. It's great to have you on this webinar as well. And now I think I'd like to just go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Branch. She is going to do a short presentation for us on renal disease and vasculitis. And we'll follow her up with a round of uh, question and answers that we've gotten actual questions from patients that might help us all out. It's all yours, Dr. Brandt. Very good. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Sandy. It's so nice to be here with uh, both of you today. So we're going to do sort of a quick overview, and then I think we've got lots of uh, good questions from patients that we'll also try to address as many as we can while we're here. Um, we're going to try to stick to stuff about kidney disease today, although, as we all know, um, vasculitis is uh, a little more involved than that most of the time. So uh, here we go. So what are some kidney-specific things that you should know um, as a patient? Well, you should probably know what ANCA are, and I'm guessing that most of you do, uh, but just for the fun of it, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibodies. So really, ANCA are these antibodies that um, kind of create havoc by uh, affecting our white blood cells. So um, that's just sort of an overview. So just, just have an idea of what that means. Um, when your doctor says ANCA, you probably don't want to go, huh? Um, so just be aware of that. It's helpful, I think, um, to have an idea of what's on your kidney biopsy. Is it just vasculitis? Some uh, other kidney diseases or uh, autoimmune diseases can overlap with vasculitis. So that can be helpful, and it may influence our understanding of how your uh, disease behaves over time. We want to get an idea of how extensive your disease is. Uh, are there crescents? Those usually just indicate uh, more active disease. Um, how many of the glomeruli, the little filters, are affected? Is it just a few in your whole biopsy specimen, or is it most of them? And again, you don't have to know every little detail, but just have an idea of what are the things on my biopsy that might influence what happens with my kidneys over time. Uh, and very important, and probably one of the biggest questions that we got is, how do I know what my kidney function is? How do I interpret these results? So we can look at kidney function multiple ways. Our sort of shorthand way of doing that is simply by looking at the creatinine. There is no one creatinine that is normal for everybody. It depends on your muscle mass. Uh, so knowing what your kidney function was before your disease is very helpful if that information is available. Um, and then we use that to then uh, calculate this EGFR, estimated glomerular filtration rate. That is the lab value that we use most of the time. So if your doctor is saying to you that you have 40% kidney function or 60% kidney function, they're probably referring to the GFR. Um, it's not really percent, uh, but it's a whole lot easier to say percent than it is the long, long tail that comes after that number. So it's a good enough estimate that way. Another way to look at kidney function is creatinine clearance, and that's actually determined one of a couple ways. It can either just be through an equation that's calculated, um, or if you want to really measure that, that's actually done with urine studies. We don't often rely on that because the uh, estimated GFR is usually very good, except for sort of people who are extremely small, extremely large with muscle, um, and then we might go to the creatinine clearance. If you happen to have both of those numbers, and they're different, that's okay. The creatinine clearance typically will be higher than the GFR just because of how the test is done. And it could be as much as 20% higher. So if you see that, certainly inquire about it, but don't be surprised to discover that those are, those are actually okay. Um, another big question or group of questions that we get is about acute kidney injury versus chronic kidney disease. So AKI versus chronic kidney disease. So we use the terminology acute kidney injury. So for Sandy, for Kathy, for all of you, when you were first diagnosed or when somebody first noticed that your kidney function wasn't normal, having been normal shortly prior to that, we call that an acute kidney injury. It just happened recently. 
We only use chronic kidney disease terminology when the kidney function has been stable for a long period of time. Under sort of general circumstances, other causes of chronic kidney disease, we usually say if it's been at a certain level for three months, then it's probably stable. I will oftentimes still not put a specific number to that stage in patients with vasculitis because the kidney function can change so much over time um, in a way that we don't often see in other types of kidney disease. Uh, but in general, chronic kidney disease is long-term and we're looking at stages. Um, also important to know, I know uh, both Kathy and Sandy mentioned their stage of chronic kidney disease. Uh, you can have chronic kidney disease stage whatever, three for example, and you can have a GFR of 59 or a GFR of 30. So just knowing the stage, probably not as important as knowing what really is my GFR. Um, other things to know is that if you have kidney disease from your vasculitis, that doesn't let you off the hook for doing all the other things that, and managing other things that can cause kidney disease. So uh, diabetes uh, is the leading cause of renal failure in the world. So if you have diabetes, you need to get that under control. That's just asking for trouble. The same is true for hypertension or high blood pressure. Um, th those are, that's the second leading cause of renal failure in the world. So if you have those, you don't want those compounding the problems that you have from your vasculitis and vice versa. So make sure that those are very well managed. Then there are the complications of having chronic kidney disease, anemia, problems with your calcium and phosphorus and other bone and mineral parameters, um, your electrolytes like potassium, uh, acid base, the acid levels in the blood, and cholesterol, and all of those things need to be managed. They're not specific to vasculitis, but once you have chronic kidney disease, you have to manage the chronic kidney disease as kind of its own thing. So how do you heal kidneys, or how can you preserve kidney function? Can it even be done? Well, the obvious first thing is that you just want to treat the vasculitis. I also strongly recommend that if you don't have a nephrologist, that you get one. Now that may sound ridiculous, but a lot of different specialists treat vasculitis, pulmonologists, rheumatologists, neurologists, gastroenterologists, all sorts of ologists. So if you have kidney involvement though, we sort of view things through a certain lens that I think is very helpful. I don't know too many other specialties who are actually gonna look at your urine themselves under a microscope and assess what's going on. Uh, in a way that just your general labs won't tell you. So if you've got kidney involvement, please get yourself a nephrologist. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, you want to avoid other causes of kidney injury. We mentioned the two big ones, diabetes and high blood pressure, but also avoid medications that can cause kidney injury. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, known as NSAIDs, includes ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Advil, naproxen, on and on and on and on and on. There are many of them those are generally not good for kidneys. So what we typically advise people is that if you have any sort of kidney injury, that you just try not to take them. If your pharmacist or your doctor or your friend says, oh, here, take this for your headache, you should say, is that an NSAID? And if they say yes, or I don't know, you say, oh, thank you, I was looking for the Tylenol. Tylenol is fine, these other ones aren't. Um, Getting CAT scans that involve giving the dye through the vein, not MRI, only CAT scans, uh, you want to ask about that. If you already have kidney injury, it puts you at risk for getting further kidney injury from that dye material itself. Um, medications called PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, that are for stomach acid and reflux. <clears throat> um, that would be things like omeprazole, uh, which is protonic. So, there has been an association with acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. It's very unpredictable who that's going to happen to. Um, but we generally say, unless you have a strong reason to be on that specific class of medications, go for something a little more innocuous like famotidine, which is Pepsid, or um, even the occasional Tums if you just have heartburn from time to time. Uh, but PPIs, we, we generally recommend saving those for the people who have it stomach ulcers or GI bleeds or things like that. Um, and another thing is if you have weight issues, obesity by itself, even if you don't have diabetes or high blood pressure, is a risk factor for kidney disease of various types. So that's something that you will want to address too, and we'll talk about that a little more later on. Um, and I won't belabor this, but if you... Um, 
if you are have been immunosuppressed, you are being immunosuppressed, or you know you're going to be because you've got that coming up, then you want to make sure that um, you get your age-appropriate cancer screening. So for women, that's your mammogram. For men, that's your prostate uh, screening, cancer screening. Um, for people who are current smokers uh, or former smokers, well, if you're a current smoker, you need to stop. That's right. I just told you, you need to stop. But uh, even if you're a former smoker, it's usually worthwhile to do at least one chest uh, CT, uh, preferably, um, just to make sure that there's nothing going on before you get immunosuppression. If you've had cyclophosphamide in the past for treatment of your vasculitis, uh, many years down the road, usually about 10, you may want to consider, and your physician may want to consider referring you to have an evaluation for bladder cancer. Um, make sure that you are up to date with your vaccine. The flu vaccine, you have to get it. Don't tell me that you got flu the last time you got it. No, you didn't. Um, you may have got the flu, but you didn't get it from the vaccine. It's really, I can't even stress how important that is. Another big one is pneumonia vaccine. There are two of them. Make sure you get both of them at the appropriate time. Uh, Tdap or tetanus diphtheria pertussis is once in a lifetime, and you probably had it as a kid. If you didn't, you don't know. Um, then it's okay to have it again. And then you get a booster every 10 years of a slightly different version of that. And if you've had, uh, if you're above the age of 60 and you've had chickenpox before, then do get your shingles vaccine. I will say I've seen multiple patients have uh, zoster or shingles flare up when they're immunosuppressed. So that is not uncommon and you will not enjoy it if it happens. So be sure you take care of that. Um, one thing that I strongly recommend patients do once they're in remission, not going to be helpful to you while you still have active disease, but once you're in remission, you don't have blood in your urine anymore, hopefully you don't have protein in the urine anymore, although that can be a little bit different, then I suggest that patients do a dipstick of their urine at home. I usually tell them once a week is a gracious plenty. Um, if you have had protein in the urine all along and that never went away, even though you're in remission, then looking at the protein is probably not going to be very helpful. But if the blood went away, as it will almost always do, um, or maybe it's just a trace level, you dip your urine at home, and if now you're saying, well, one plus blood, and you don't have a good explanation for that, I would repeat it the next day. And if it's still there, that's when you call your provider, your nephrologist. Um, and don't wait, because that you are going to catch a flare maybe before you have symptoms. Um, and maybe before anybody is going to see a lab result that is going to say that something is going on. The sooner you catch it, the sooner you treat it, the less damage it does. Strongly recommend that. All right, so what do you need to manage your disease? Well, one thing you need is the quote-unquote right provider, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. And, of course, I did mention that for those with kidney involvement, a nephrologist is part of that right provider equation. And it's kind of silly, but follow, at least be open-minded to the recommenda recommendations that they're making. Um, if there's something that doesn't seem right to you, then certainly bring it up, address it. You need to have somebody you're comfortable enough with to actually say, I'm not so sure about that. Um, you know, here's my concern. Um, recognize, though, that treatment is tricky. It's not always as straightforward as we would like. So as Kathy herself mentioned, you know, she's had multiple types of treatment, and the same is true for Sandy, as it is for many people. We are learning more and more uh, over time about how best to treat these diseases. But sometimes for certain people, one or two agents don't work very well, and another one does, or a combination of them. Um, so don't throw in the towel just because the, the first thing around didn't work or because it's taking time, because it's not like an antibiotic 48 hours, you're feeling better. We're talking months and in some patients years. Um, it is also okay to get an expert opinion at one place but be followed by someone else locally. Not everyone has the advantage of having somebody with a lot of expertise in vasculitis right down the street. But if you uh, are able to do it, you can always go to one of the bigger centers. UNC is a perfect example, Columbia, Ohio, UPenn, et cetera, et cetera. You can always go get some recommendations there but then have your local provider work with that expert to get you the treatment that you, that you need. It's going to sound a little bit silly when I say think about something else. How does that have to do with managing your disease? So the reality is, is that once you have disease, it can be all-consuming, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You think about it, you sleep, you dream about it, um, you, you talk about it. 
but you have to have a break from it. You're not going to train, change your outcome by spending every moment of your day worrying and thinking about this disease. So try to let it go and do some other things. So about that finding the right doctors, well, how do you do that? Well, you ask. The Vasculitis Foundation has uh, uh, contact information for numerous excellent providers. You can contact a lar one of those larger centers that I mentioned. You're welcome to get in touch with me if I know someone in your area. If I don't, I'll ask other people that I do know, um, or I can uh, try to facilitate any sort of uh, contact that you might need. You do want somebody with experience, um, and that's where the challenge comes in. You want somebody who's responsive. Now, be realistic. If you're emailing that your cholesterol was above 100, that's not urgent, right? So, um, so allow time. However, that being said, and this is what I do with my patients, is have a plan. If there is something that you are really worried about and you know that your doctor is going to be out of town, what is the plan for you if that happens? Who do you call? Who do you talk to? Um, so I usually try to plan ahead with my patients. What are we going to do if I'm not immediately available? How long should you wait? Where should you go? Um, and the last thing, and I touched on this before, is you want somebody who's collaborative because many patients with vasculitis have multiple providers. You know, I, I'm a nephrologist. I, I can acknowledge that someone has lung disease. I can treat their lung disease, but I cannot say this is worse, this is better, um, some of the uh, sort of ancillary medications like inhalers and things, that's not my area of expertise. So you might have a pulmonologist, a rheumatologist, and, you know, we, all of those folks. And they all have to be willing to work together. They can't be, no, I'm the boss of everyone. You know, here's what I'm planning. What do you guys think? Do you have one bus driver that uh, have people who are willing to work together? Now, what do you need to feel better? Well, all those things that we just your treatment and uh, the right medications. Uh, as Sandy mentioned, her hope to eventually not be taking any medications and definitely not steroids. That's something that we do try to do and everyone tries to do is um, steroids. I think Sandy uh, and Kathy as well can attest to this. They're really great when you first start them because you felt so terrible that you are astounded how much better you feel. But long term, they don't make, feel, make people feel all that wonderful. So. Um, so the, the less uh, we can do that, the better. And there are some new medications um, in the pipeline that hopefully will help with that. Make sure that you have some support. And it can't just be your doctor, right? Um, if you have family, some people don't have family. If you have friends, if you have a church, if you have people in your community, just make sure that there are people there who can sort of uh, buoy you when, when you're feeling like you're kind of going under the water a little bit. Also, keep your life even when you don't feel like it, right? You're going to be so tired sometimes. You're going to feel six times. You are, you know, you're just not going to want to deal with anything. But the more that you can keep your life that you had prior to vasculitis, the better off you will be. Again, it's this idea of, yeah, this diagnosis changes everything, but don't let it change everything. Don't let it just take over. And then lastly, Use this as an opportunity, which just sounds like heresy. I do realize that, but let me tell you what I mean. So this is your opportunity to really achieve your well-being. So if you are like some of us, myself included, maybe we don't always eat best, or maybe we don't really exercise, or maybe we say, oh, I don't have time to do that fun thing because I have to work, or I have to write notes, or I have to do, do laundry, whatever. So now is your opportunity to say, I don't have a choice. I have this very serious disease. I need to step back and say, what are the things I can control? And those are the things that you take care of from on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you know that your dietary habits are not good, then work on changing that. If you're not sure how to change it, talk to a nutritionist. Please don't get this information from the guy at the gym. He is not a nutritionist, no matter what he thinks. So just make sure you get uh, the appropriate advice. And I think we'll talk about that a little more later. You know, you don't have to do major exercise. And in fact, if you're on prednisone, you probably shouldn't be doing heavy duty uh, weight lifting or strenuous exercise, but remain active. It might just be taking walks. That's perfectly fine. Play out in the yard with your dog or your kids, whatever. Um, but make sure you are active. Make sure that you do have fun. That really is part of your well-being. Um, again, it's 
focusing on something other than disease and other than the just mundane parts of life uh, take time out for some, some good times. Also be mindful of your mental health. Um, so the way I often describe vasculitis, because, you know, I find that the vast majority of my patients with vasculitis, they were actually pretty darn healthy people before that diagnosis, sometimes extremely healthy people. And then all of a sudden, it is like the bus jumps the curb and runs over them on their own front doorstep. It's terrible. For some people, it's so bad that it's like a tsunami. So it can really change people's perceptions of themselves. And that is so important. I was a healthy person, and now I'm not. I was able to do this, that, and the other, and now I can't. And so that can really, uh, it can be depressing, it can be overwhelming, it can be anxiety provoking. So whether you need a counselor or a social worker or just your pastor or your priest or members of your church, whomever, but just be mindful of your own mind and make sure that you take care of it. And also be sure that you have healthy relationships and healthy boundaries. Um, and what I'm mostly thinking about there is I see a lot of times either in spouse or, you know, partner relationships or parent-child relationships um, where the child has the disease. And I use the term child loosely. Um, it's very easy for the, the non-patient to become just the caregiver and the patient to be just the patient. And so they lose that sense of, you no, know, actually we're spouses or we're partners or we're mother or child. And it becomes all about the disease of the one person and the caregiving of the other person. So try to, you know, have someone else take over some of that caregiving responsibility so that you can maintain your, your healthy, happy relationships. So what do you need to have hope? Well, you should know that we're actually pretty darn good at treating ankyvasculitis in particular. We're always working to get better at it, and I think that we have over the years. Um, we now know some treatments are better than others. We now know things that we thought we needed before we don't necessarily need, um, and there are new medications on the horizon. Medium and large vessel vasculitis, I'll just touch on, they're harder to treat in general because we don't have the kind of lab studies that sort of tell us what's going on. Um, so that makes it challenging, but again, very doable. And cryoglobulinemic vasculitis is just a very, very difficult mm -hmm. disease to treat. Despite that, no matter what you have, you will feel better eventually. Yeah, there's the caveat, that eventually part of it. So the reality is, is this is, again, it's not an antibiotic 48 hours you feel better. This is a long, long, long haul. And it's not just a straight haul. It's up and down, and I'm feeling better, and I'm feeling worse, and I flare, and I feel terrible, and you know something else is happening. So just recognize that you will feel better, and you may feel better in a month, but you'll probably feel even better than that in six months, and even better than that in three years. So uh, just know that things are always evolving and changing, um, and you will feel better, I promise. So one of the big things that people talk about um, and ask about is fatigue. It is extraordinary in vasculitis. We actually don't know what causes it. Um, it's been studied. We don't think it's inflammation. There are people who complain of ongoing fatigue long into remission. It seems to be the last symptom that resolves, and it can be mind-numbing, this fatigue, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. So what do you do about it? Well, I think partly you do what Sandy says, which you sleep. You sleep when you need to sleep, if you have a, a job or a schedule that will allow it, that if you need a nap in the middle of the day, you take a nap in the middle of the day. If you have uh, the opportunity to maybe change the structure of your work a little bit to accommodate that, then that's what you do. But, but try to rest when you need rest. Don't beat yourself up for being fatigued and saying, oh, I should just be able to push myself more. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't think you can do it, and you shouldn't do it. Just be patient with yourself. And medication side effects, certainly that could be part of the fatigue too. Um, but again, even when you're off, you can have this fatigue. But, you know, recognize that some of those medications, they're just not the most fun to take. Um, and they'll have side effects. But those side effects will go away once you're not taking the medication anymore. It'll pass. So that's sort of my overview. And that's my contact information. So if, if people have questions after the questions we do today, um, you're more than welcome to be in touch. Usually the email is the 
the best way. And if I don't get back to you in a reasonable time frame, a few days, then please feel free to email me again because they do kind of get lost in the, the mass of mostly junk mail that I get. Okay. So um, I know we, we have a, a number of questions, and so we're going to have a Q&A roundtable here to try to address some of those. Uh, these questions actually came directly from patients. Um, but Kathy and Sandy, I was hoping before that maybe you could tell us a little bit more uh, about what your experience has been like. So Sandy, Sandy why, don't, why, don't we, yeah, why don't we let you go first, Sandy? All right. Um, as I stated in my intro, I've had um, kidney problems for five and a half years, and I'm one of those people that is waiting for the happy ending. I have absolutely amazing physicians at Ohio State University, and I have a top-notch nephrologist whom I trust with my life. But it's, it is very frustrating when I go in and have labs every one to three months, and my GFR goes anywhere from 40 to 60 at this point. So the hardest thing for me is just to keep my mental health in a positive mode when these things happen. And I appreciate, Dr. Brandt, that you say how very important it is to have a support system. I feel as though I do have a support system, and that is indeed very, very important. Um, it sounds like I'm really, really sick. However, I still do enjoy a tremendous amount of traveling with my husband and family, and I spend a great deal of time, every opportunity I get, babysitting with my granddaughter. So health issues, I still feel that I live a very happy, fortunate life. Very nice. And what about you, Kathy? Well, I would say that I'm in a great place right now, um, and great is relative, <laughs> because even in remission, <laughs> there there are a lot of special things that go on. I, I had um, I had quite a fight in the beginning. I was... Uh, in pretty serious condition when I was referred to Dr. Falk and um, he was he and his whole team including Dr. Brandt were were wonderful with me they you all helped me um, manage all of the different things and and since I was diagnosed in 2008 it was kind of the to me now looking back it was some earlier phases of things that did not work very well for me and then um, it was when I hit rituximab that things started to turn around. And I, I don't have full kidney function, but I'm satisfactory. <laughs> and I, uh, <laughs> I don't have grandiose energy. I'm not the same person I was before I was diagnosed. But I think I, I live maybe a normal life for somebody my age anyway. And I was had aspirations of being much younger than somebody my age, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's, um, I think I'm in a good place and I, and I wish that for all of, I have a few friends that I have met over the years that have a version of vasculitis and I wish that for everybody. And I, the only thing that I would say, and Dr. Brent, maybe you can, you know, touch on this a little bit more is just that I feel like the early years are the hardest because you feel like you're the only person with this disease because <laughs> it's so rare. And, and the mental thing was probably the hardest for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can, I can tell everyone that knowing Kathy that she actually is a lot younger than other people her age, even though she may not feel it. Um, but I, but I know exactly what you're talking about and you're, you're absolutely right. It's, like I said, it's, you know, you're just minding your own business, and this thing just comes in and just sweeps over everything, and then it's all about that, and it's appointments. That, you know, you might be a person who really went to the doctor. Maybe you had your annual physical, and, and now you're at the doctor all the time. You maybe didn't take any medications before. Now you're on six, eight, ten of them. Um, <coughs> it really does. It, it, it kind of messes with your mind a lot. Um, and, and having to learn, all right, so who am I despite this illness, around this illness, with this illness? Um, have I lost my entire self? What do I get to keep? What do I have to let go of? And that, that is just, that's going to be uh, different from person to person. Um, you know, some people who have just less severe disease, um, it, it may not be so overwhelming for them, but people and I know like you especially with the work that you do you know 
energy is sort of key to to being able to teach people martial arts and do them. And so um so that's just gonna vary and, and those early years are just they're so difficult and they're so awful, let's just be honest. Um, and like you said, finding other people um, who can uh, share that experience and also uh, people who are past it to say, okay, just hang in there, hang in there. It really is going to get better. It's going to take time, but it's going to get better. Um, but yeah, it's a lot to let go of what you envisioned your life was going to be versus what it became. Um, that's that's just that's really hard okay and now we're going to move on to an important part of the webinar a question and answer roundtable with dr. Brandt Sandy and I are going to ask questions and that have been submitted by other patients uh, obviously there are probably more questions than we have time to cover in this webinar but webinar but we may do another one in the future to address more questions that we can't cover but I did want to say that because this is a limited forum to give you comprehensive answers we always advise you to consult with your physician first with any questions concerns or issues related to your illness you know a question and answer session is not a substitute for communicating any issues directly with your health care provider so having said that, I think I'll turn it over to Sandy and let her start with some of the questions that we've gotten from some of you patients. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Dr. Brandt, for your outstanding slide presentation. Um, I'm a co-administrator. I'm a co-administrator of three ANCA Facebook sites. And I put out a plea for people to watch Dr. Brandt's previous online programs and also ask them if they had any questions for today's webinar. And the following questions are from those people who are indeed ANCA patients with kidney disorder. First question is, once you have chronic kidney disease, do you always have chronic kidney disease, even if your numbers are in or near their normal range? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. So by definition, chronic kidney disease is that. It's kidney disease that's ongoing. And here, it's always a little tricky, especially when I see patients, not vasculitis patients, but just in general, and I say chronic kidney disease. And really all we're saying is that the kidney function, there's something about the kidneys and their function that is not normal. So as Kathy said, her kidney function is actually almost normal. We could still say that she has chronic kidney disease. I probably would assign a stage to it because it's such an early stage. I usually don't bother with the ones and the twos. Um, but once chronic kidney disease, once you have it, you do have it. Um, so near normal is still not normal. Um, and again, the staging is, is just going to vary depending on what the level is. Thank you. Last summer, Dr. Brandt, you suggested Pepsid or Zantac for acid reflux. And tonight, you suggested Pepsid or Tums. And I'm assuming that's because Zantac has been found questionable. Should we avoid Zantac altogether and stick with Pepsid or Tums? Yeah, so you might not even be able to get the Zantac because I think it was recalled. Um, and Zantac is ranitidine is the generic name for it. So, yeah, so 10 towards the Pepsid, which is fine. It's in the same class. But, um, but uh, and like I said, Tums is also an option. Terrific. Thank you. When we need antibiotics, Unfortunately, many of us are hospitalized and need antibiotic therapies. We worry that the type or dose of antibiotics may be harmful to our kidneys. Should this be a concern? You know, it actually should be a, a concern in the sense that you want to be aware of, of getting and how it's being monitored. So let's say you're not in the hospital, that you just got whatever, some infection, and your, uh, maybe your primary care doctor or even one of your specialty providers wants to prescribe an antibiotic. So there are some antibiotic classes that are more likely than others to cause certain types of problems. So some people have an allergic type reaction to some antibiotics. Um, the problem is that that allergic type reaction may only occur in the kidneys. So the only way that you would know it's happening is for your kidney function to be monitored um, heaven forbid that it be so severe that you stop urinating or anything like that. But it's not like you're going to see blood in your urine. Um, it's just going to be a, a change in the kidney function. Um, and that's an inflammatory thing. So that would need to be addressed. Um, I would suggest that 
again, if you're getting an antibiotic that you've had before without any problems, it's probably not a big deal. But if it's a brand new antibiotic that you've never had, um, then maybe having the kidney function checked beforehand and maybe right after. Um, if it's going to be a long course of antibiotics, two or three weeks or something, even the first few days into it, because you'll know pretty quickly if you're having a reaction. Um, and again, that doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen, so just something to be aware of. The types of oh. medications do that seem to be more associated with things you might get in the hospital. There's some of the IV antibiotics that seem particularly um, uh, likely to do that. Again, not super common, but just to be aware of, if you're in the hospital, they're checking your kidney function all the time anyway. So I think that's going to be, be picked up pretty quickly. The other thing to be aware of with antibiotics, and again, most providers should uh, should know this, unless they don't know your kidney function when they prescribe the antibiotic, um, is that the dose often has to be adjusted for your level of kidney function. If your kidney function is close to normal, probably not. It's usually when the kidney function is quite a bit lower, um, but they should be aware of that and adjust the dose accordingly. Not for all of them, but for some of them. And there are very specific guidelines for that that are available. Oh, that's that's very good to know. Thank you. Having a flare that involves our kidneys is one of our greatest fears. In addition to protecting our kidneys, which you discussed in your slides, are there any additional indicators or signs of a flare that we should watch for? Yes, yeah, so, um, and I think this may come up in another question, it certainly comes up in my clinic, is um, it, if you have kidney involvement, can you have involvement elsewhere in your body? And the answer is yes. Um, and so what I typically tell people uh, when I see them in clinic, I go through a thorough, what we call, review of systems. It's really sort of a head-to-toe assessment. Have you had any problems with this and this and this and this? And knowing, kind of recognizing what those questions are, then I say, if any of those occur, then you need to let someone know. Um, what I tell people, because, you know, you're not going to remember a list of 25 questions that I ask you in clinic, is I tell people, especially in the early phase, if anything is different, if you feel different, if it's a pain, if it's a, a whatever, it's my left knee feels funny, I, I don't really care. If anything at all feels different, then just call me because we can oftentimes address it on the phone, I'll, especially here's where I see it commonly. I've got a little cough. My nose is a little runny. My whole family has a cold. Well, you probably just have a cold, but here's what we're going to do about that. So. You know, and those, until you, I, for lack of a better way to put it, until you get to know your disease, then you're not going to be sure. And I, I never mind people calling, even if they're like, oh, this seems silly, because it may very well be something that we need to address. So, um, so things like, you didn't have a cough before, but now you do. Certainly, if you have a cough and there's any blood in the sputum, you absolutely need to, you just go to the emergency room. Don't just. Don't even call me first. Call me from the ER. Um, if you have like trouble with your hearing that you didn't have before, you start having chronic or frequent uh, ear infections because they may not be infections at all. Uh, same with the sinuses. If you're having sores in your mouth, little tiny blistery kind of sores in your mouth that, that you weren't having before. Um, if you start having abdominal pain, and that's new for you and it's pretty persistent, if you have blood in your stool, those would be examples. Um, joint pains that are new. Uh, usually the way I ask it is, do you have any new or unusual joint pains? Because people will recognize that it's a little odd. They'll say, you know, my left knee was hurting the other day, and that lasted about two hours, and then my right ankle started hurting, and then the next day it was my left elbow. And that sort of migratory is what we call it, migratory pattern of joint pain is often consistent with active disease. Even if it's not migratory, though, if it's new, you just let your doctor know. If you have a new rash that you have never had before, that would be another one. Um, so really, anything that is new, out of the ordinary, just make the phone call. Uh, the worst that can happen is your doctor can say, oh my gosh, I think something terrible is going on. Come to the emergency room. You know, and then you do. And then it'll pass. Oh, that's excellent advice. You know, I know that many ANCA patients are fearful of calling their doctor because they are afraid that it takes up too much time. In cases like that, is it also effective to use an online portal if one is available? So it depends on um, how severe the symptom is. 
So okay. I would say that if it's something where you're like, hmm, but, oh, I should also add, if you're having fevers that you don't have an explanation for, like, I don't feel like I have an infection, but I'm having fevers. If you're having night sweats, you wake up during the night and your clothes or your uh, bedding is soaked in sweat. Those are other things that you need to pick up the phone and call because um, those can also be due to active disease. So it's, if it's something that you think is really, truly urgent, then pick up the phone and call because you don't know if your provider might not be there. And so if they're not, they can you can get hooked up to somebody else or they can find your provider and make sure that person contacts you. If it's something that you think, well, maybe I should look into this, then the portal is fine. Things like the blood in the urine when you're doing your dipsticks, that is not a portal question. <laughs> that is a that is a pick up the phone and call question. But if it's like, okay, my knee was a little achy, but I also was out working in the yard yesterday, you know, give it a day or go ahead and send the message in the portal. Um, and then if the next day, if it's worse or persistent, you can get back in touch and say, oh, yeah, no, it's really bothering me now. Or you can say, you know what, I iced it last night, it's fine. Um, and so it's just sort of going to rely on your sense of this could be important. If you don't know if it's important, just pick up the phone and call. Nobody should fault you for that. Next question, Dr. Brandt. If you receive a kidney transplant, can vasculitis attack the new kidney? So, um, yes, it could. It seems that, uh, to the sense that we have any kind of uh, data or information on this, it seems that it is less likely to flare in the transplant, and that's probably because when you get a transplant, you're on immunosuppressive medication. So that may be what keeps things at bay. Um, but nevertheless, I tell everyone, even my uh, patients with renal limited disease, they only had kidney disease and they end up on dialysis, I still follow them because they could uh, develop uh, symptoms or signs somewhere else in their body. Another organ, organ could be involved. So with a transplant, somewhat less likely probably to have a flare in the kidney, but it can happen. I would recommend you would probably have a transplant nephrologist who manages all your transplant meds but you should still be in touch uh, closely with your nephrologist who has been managing your vasculitis just to make sure you're still doing okay. With rituximab and maintenance drugs, will it keep the disease at a standstill or is it still doing damage to the kidneys at a slower rate? So that's a great question. It sort of depends on where you are in your disease course. So let's say you have active disease and you're just being treated with rituximab or something else, then until the, what's, it's really the inflammation that is causing the, the damage here, until that is completely at bay, you could potentially have some ongoing injury. But usually, if the things are caught quickly enough, that can sort of be arrested and then hopefully even with the treatment of the inflammation have some recovery. So, um, as I sort of mentioned in the talk, if you have inflammation on the biopsy, I always tell patients when I get their biopsy back, oh, there's a lot of inflammation. That's great because I can treat inflammation, but I cannot treat a scar. That, that's too far gone. So um, once you are in remission, the whole goal of the drugs, rituximab and the other maintenance drugs, is to keep the kidney function stable. Um, you should not have ongoing damage from the disease itself while you're in remission. Um, but once you have a lot of kidney injury, uh, then the kidney function can tend to decline over time. Hopefully, we'll stay stable for a long, 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 long time, but it is possible for it just to decline just from the long-standing sort of injury that you've had. So the goal of remission maintenance is to prevent damage from the vasculitis. It is still possible for the kidney function to, to decline over time. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. How often should I have labs if I'm not in remission versus if I am in remission? So this is going to be highly um, user dependent. So I'm just going to kind of tell you what I do. If you are not in remission, I am probably seeing you about once a month um, until I make sure that you get in remission. Because I'm going to want to know you know, are we seeing any improvement at all? I want to look at your urine. I want to say, well, you know, you're not quite in remission yet, but boy, you had 500 red cells last time, and now you have 25. 
Um, so things are definitely improving. So there's really no way for me to assess that unless I'm actually seeing a person looking at their urine, looking at their lab. If somebody is in a new remission, they're in remission, hasn't been very long, they're still on maintenance therapy, then I'm probably going to maybe stretch that out to every couple months. If I'm in a really good mood, I'll do three months, but probably not. Um, but even if they're in a long-standing remission, about the most I will go without seeing somebody is six months. But they have to have been in a stable remission for a very long time and be dipping their urine at home. So again, that's going to vary from provider to provider. But I'm, I, uh, I like to see people frequently. I like to stay on top of things. And some people might say I'm slightly controlling. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, and Dr. Brandt, if I could ask you a few things about lifestyle choices. What should I eat? Uh, coming from other patients, they want to know what should I eat and what should I not eat to help preserve remaining kidney function, you know, a, a good kidney-friendly diet tips to protect our kidneys. Right. So, um, so this is a huge topic, and I get this question. I, I rarely have a clinic where I don't get this question, regardless of the cause of somebody's kidney disease. So the sort of... The simple things are um, you probably should be avoiding sodium because if you have kidney disease, there's a really good chance you have uh, high blood pressure or are kind of uh, inclined to have high blood pressure. So yeah, I would avoid that. Um, what we're now recognizing, I'm going to tell you what we know about data, and I'm going to tell you about my personal preferences, and then you can pick your, your own. So what we now know, people are finally recognizing that in patients with kidney disease, as I believe in all people, um, a plant-based diet is healthier than a non-plant-based diet. Um, so people hear me say that and they're like, oh, no, I can't eat meat. Well, you can, um, but the bulk of your food should be from plants and not from animals. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons behind that, that not even from a vasculitis standpoint, but purely from a chronic kidney disease standpoint, um, you get less uric acid, you get less problems with phosphorus, you get less problems with your acid levels in the blood. So um, there are a lot of reasons to eat a plant-based diet. What about, you know, if you're, if you're not quite ready for that, at least do the obvious things. So if your favorite food is a devil dog, and for those who don't know what a devil dog is, think ho-ho, right? Like, <laughs> not good. Not good. Like, you could put it on a shelf and come back five late, five years later, it would look the same and it would taste the same. So, so, so that's not good. I do have a patient that is her favorite food. So we joke about that. I also have one whose favorite food is beef jerky, which is really revolting. Um, so, you know, the obvious thing, so don't be eating a boatload of sugar. Um, there are some people, myself included, who would say you should probably avoid dairy. Again, it's along the whole animal-based product thing. Um, so I, I'm going to leave that in the, I think there are good data for that, but I'm going to leave it sort of in the more personal philosophical realm um, that I think that people should be eating plants and not animals. I think from a health standpoint, um, the plants are better. So, um, but at least do the obvious. Get rid of the milkshakes. Please don't eat the fast food. Please stop eating Doritos. They're disgusting. I loved them when I was in college. <laughs> I'm over it. I'm totally over it. If you made me eat one now, I'd probably pass out. Um, so uh, to say, you know, plants rather than animals, good, fresh, plant-based foods that you make yourself are always better. Well, that sounds like great advice. I, I will tell you that I had one related to that. One last question. Somebody asked about exercising regularly and what you can do to help protect your kidneys. I, that's a great question coming from me, too, because I do... A lot of I try to do a lot of working out now that I am in remission, and I just never know, you know, am I doing too much, or should I be more careful about things like that? Yeah, it's a great question, and you know, I don't know if we have any really good data about it, like real studies about it. What I will say that if you're on prednisone, you probably should not be doing, you know, no sprints and no heavy-duty weightlifting, simply because the prednisone will weaken your muscles and your tendons so you're more likely to injure them. Um, if you, uh, Kathy, like in your case where you've been in remission for a long time, you can probably do just about anything that you want. I would say, sort of like I view life in general, just avoid the extremes. I'm pretty sure you're not deadlifting like 300 pounds. Please tell me that you're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, things like that. Sort of extreme weightlifting, extreme uh, running, um, 
it just, you know, normal. And for you, normal is different for me because I don't really exercise very much at all. <laughs> I don't exercise at all. Anyway, um, but, you know, you are just, by virtue of your profession and your, your interest, you are just a more active person. And I can't imagine that you're doing anything uh, that's going to be harmful. Um, so if you do a lot of very strenuous exercise, it may influence some of your lab results. So that could be a little confusing for people. Um, if you were not exercising and now you are and you have a lot more muscle mass, your kidney function may look lower because your creatinine will be higher. It does not necessarily mean that's true. That would be one of those scenarios where I would go, I'm not going to rely on the GFR. I'm going to do another study to get a more precise measurement. Um, but that's sort of a, a, a very fine point. So I would say moderate exercise, nothing of the extremes get off the couch, take a walk at least, um, and that should probably be fine. Well, gosh, that was extremely helpful. All of those uh, answers to all of those questions. I think we're about out of time for questions and answers for this webinar. And we want to thank everybody for submitting their questions. And we hope we've considered most of them. I found it all extremely helpful. Um, I also would like to, at this point, thank um, GlaxoSmithKline for their support of our 2020 educational webinar series. We're, we're always in need of uh, sponsors that will help us continue to educate our vasculitis community. And next, I um, just want to say to remember to watch Dr. Brandt's full video lecture on kidney involvement on the Vasculitis Foundation website. Uh, her webin the webinar today was abbreviated, but you can see the full one from the 2019 symposium. You can also view her full lecture video by visiting the educational video library on the VF website. That's vasculitisfoundation.org. You should click the Learn tab and choose Educational Videos, and then select 2019 Symposium Videos to find that video. And we would like for our viewers to know that the go-to resource for patients with vasculitis is the Vasculitis Foundation website. It's a great educational and supportive resource that helps patients better understand and manage this complex disease. You can find information on all the various forms of vasculitis. You can order disease brochures. You can use the Find a Doctor section to locate a medical professional or center that treats vasculitis. In 2020, there will be a series of regional conferences throughout the country, and you'll need to visit the website to learn when and where these one-day conferences will be held. And lastly, I just want to leave you with what I think is the best thing you can do to keep up with all of the exciting events and developments with the Vasculitis Foundation. I personally encourage you to sign up today for the Vasculitis Foundation e-news. It's a free monthly email newsletter that tells you what you need to know about what's happening with the VF. You'll learn more about upcoming regional conferences and webinars. You can find out about clinical studies that are recruiting and you'll the latest research news. All you have to do is to subscribe on the Vasculitis Foundation website and you'll begin to get each new issue. So use that link that you see here today and go sign up for the Vasculitis Foundation e-news today. Okay, I would also just like to take a moment to say thank you so much to Dr. Brandt for giving us her time to answer these questions. It's great to have such a resource that would come on a webinar and do that for us. And, and Sandy, who is um, in touch with so many people through her um, Facebook communities, she's able to get the questions so that she can get them properly answered. And we, we appreciate everyone coming on and being uh, listening to the webinar and, and for our presenters today. Thank you so much for your efforts.